Okay, hello, hello. Thank you for coming today. It is two o'clock my time, 11 o'clock Pacific, I believe. So um, I only have 55 minutes for this talk. I'll go ahead and get rolling. So uh, thank you for coming. My name is Rose and today we'll be doing part talk, part uh, workshop of information security management system. Uh, so if you can't hear me, if my audio is not right or the screen's not sharing very well, feel free to, to drop a comment in the chat. I'll be monitoring it uh, to get us through this little workshop that we have. So um, with that, I'll just dive right in. Uh, I decided to uh, start doing a lessons learned type uh, talk on information security management systems because through the course of my career, and especially the past couple years, I have had a whirlwind of um, how to implement ISMS, the things you do, the things you don't do, and all sorts of stuff like that. And I always have these really great conversations with my clients where they're like, you know, what are the things that we should have done better? And maybe even after we end an engagement, or like, what should we have done better? And so this talk was really inspired by what are the things that made these audits, made this implementation really painful. And hopefully you have some good takeaways where maybe in the future you do not repeat my mistakes or, you know, my missteps or, you know, things that made it particularly painful for me. So um, inspired from that and hopefully you guys get a lot of insight. Now, as we go through this talk, um, I will be um, stopping to show you guys a couple of things. Um, in particular, I have a statement of applicability uh, draft available. Um, we're going to look at risk assessment in a very, very short mock through of that. And then um, we'll also look at corrective action plans. So if you're not familiar with any of those, um, we're going to dive a little bit deeper there. Um, and if you have any questions on anything that maybe is not put in here and you think I might have some advice or experienced it, feel free to drop that in the chat too and we can have more of a collaborative session going. So uh, a quick intro, my name is Rose. I am a governance risk and compliance manager at a small consulting firm called CISO. Uh, CISO uh, specializes in all sort of, sort of consulting um, engagements for GRC and Blue. And in particular, we specialize in making these very simplified security solutions, whether it's things in governance, risk and compliance, things in tech, and making them solutions that are easy for our clients to manage and implement. So we come in, we help them do all of those things. Um, I have my CISSP, I have a master's uh, in cybersecurity, bachelor's in advanced networking, uh, security plus, and a bunch of other things. So i uh, been around for quite some time, just working on my education and the things that could improve me. Um, been in IT a total of 15 years, which makes me feel insanely old um, and spent the last nine of those in security. So started out in the Navy and eventually made my, my way into the civilian side of things. And uh, it's definitely a crazy journey. It gave me tons of industry experience, um, worked in retail, higher education, worked in healthcare. So do a lot of healthcare type consulting and government. So that's just a little bit about me. And I always like to include my uh, family, my kid critters and my pet critters. Uh, so um, the animals that you'll see, you'll probably see them sometime during this presentation. If you do not, I will be really shocked. Um, I have a kitten and a cat that just like to make themselves home right behind me over my shoulder. There's one sleeping there right now. And then the dog likes to pop up on the screen. So if you guys see them. Apologies in advance. <laughs> All right, so enough about me. Let's talk about ISMS, which is really why you guys are here. So before we really dig into like, what are these lessons learned and how we should avoid these pain parts, let's talk about what exactly is ISMS? Because I'm going to say it a bunch and I want to make sure that we all level set. We're all on the same page of what 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 is Rose actually talking about? So we'll talk about what is an ISMS. We will discuss whether or not it's actually worth implementing um, ongoing program management and then the ISO 27001 breakdown. So if you're not familiar with any of those, we're just going to level set real quick. It's not meant to, you know, provide you all your education. It's supposed to be an ultra crash course, just a level set. So information security management system. I have to tell you guys, this is by far one of my favorite frameworks. Um, 
it really puts your, your organization in a continuous improvement cycle. So as you think about your security program and what you want it to look like and grow to and evolve to or whatever, um, you want it to mature over time. And so I, I just love this one because it kind of forces the issue. It forces you to have management bought in. It forces you to have governance. It has you doing all these things, but it puts yourself in a really good position. But your organization has to embrace it. They really have to be a part of that plan, do, check, act cycle to get the full benefit of that continuous improvement. So um, this this particular framework, it, it gets you into that cycle through all the things that it has you doing. You get your leadership bought in. You get your governance developed. You do your risk assessments. You do corrective action plans. You do all these different things. And through that life cycle, you start to improve your program year over year. So lots of good things happening there. Now, when we think about these compliance or regulatory things that we're trying to do, um, a lot of the pushback is like, well, is it even worth doing? And the answer is all, always absolutely yes. Like we need to be doing these things. There's tons of good return on investment. Um, you could have improved communication and transparency, competitive advantage. We'll talk about the competitive advantage though, because you got to be uh, careful with that ISO logo. You don't want to use it in an inappropriate way because that could lead to nonconformity during your audit, but we'll dig into that in a little bit. Um, you can leverage it as proof of your information security program for your clients, your customers, whatever you call them. Um, so we all work in technology. We know this is a thing. Our clients are now wanting to know how we're going to secure their data and make sure that we're protecting it. So uh, this will allow you to be able to demonstrate that. Um, it'll improve your change management. It'll give you building blocks to other frameworks. A really great example here, I had a client, um, they've been ISO 27001 for years, since 2018. And recently, we implemented High Trust on top of it. And they were able to get High Trust certified and leverage that particular framework to build on their controls and set a really good program in place. So you can use it to building blocks to other things and make the implementation of controls in those other framework standards um, easier to implement. And then again, it, it makes you go into that continuous improvement cycle. So um, lots of really good return on investment, but you have to be able to sell it to the business, right? Or sell it to your leadership. If you are in a place where maybe your leadership isn't bought in, you really have to be able to build that business case for them however you want to build the business case. And a lot of times you can start on the return on investment or take it from the other perspective. Um, you know, the, the route of risk. What's the risk associated with not having a security program in place? Talk in dollars because management's always gonna understand dollars and you'll likely get that buy-in that you need. Now, obviously, you want them to be bought in because they truly understand the value of it. Um, but in this way, you can can kind of show them the dollars. If we were to have a breach, it would result in X amount of money. Whereas if we just implement this program, it's going to cost half of that and we have a secure environment. Yeah, getting money, getting buy in from the money people, the decision makers spot on. That's exactly what you're doing. All right. So program management. Um, so with other, with the framework, this really forces your hand. You have to be watching it. Um, you have to be making sure that you're doing all the things that you need to. So you'll have better processes. Um, you'll have better top management support and awareness. You have ind independent internal audits going on. So that is a requirement of ISO 27001 is that you have internal audit. Um, so a lot of these things are just forcing the hand of making sure that you have really good program management. And I mean, if you're implementing this program, you likely want to be able to do that anyways, but it allows you to kind of stabilize there and have your path forward on how you're going to manage your program. Now, I should be clear. I keep saying management buy-in. Um, ISO 27001 is definitely not something that is just management buy-in because if you've implemented this, this standard at all, you know that it spans across multiple process areas, multiple groups within the organization. And so not only do we want to have the money people bought in, but we also want to have the people bought in that will likely be the implementers of these. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but something to, to keep in your mind as we talk about these things. So ISO 27001 is broken into two distinct areas. You have your clauses and then you have your Annex A. So the clauses are mandatory. You have to have those implemented. Um, that is what is prompting you in your continuous improvement cycle through that plan, do, check, act, is those clauses four through 10. 
So the, the clause has really set the stage of what you're going to be doing in ISO and how you're going to run your program and the things that you need to do for it. Now, Annex A is a catalog of information security controls that you can select from as a result of a risk assessment and eventually make their way into your statement of applicability. So uh, everything from Annex A does not need to be implemented, but you definitely need to have a reason why you're not implementing certain things and being aware of all those particular controls contained within there, which there's roughly about 114. Um, so these controls are considered the bare minimum. You do not need to implement anything more than it, but if you do implement anything more, um, you're highly encouraged to make sure you're maintaining awareness. So if you start building, leveraging as a building block, making sure that, you know, Annex A leads to SOC 2, leads to high trust, leads to FedRIP, leads to whatever, and you're maintaining some awareness of the controls and how they're cross-mapping and how they're implemented and things like that. So there's a lot of nuances that start occurring once you implement this. And um, as you grow and mature, it, it gets easier over time, but it's never completely painless. Um, you just get better at it. So that was the ultra breakdown. Um, if you guys need more information than that, I have tons of references and resources and all sorts of things at the end of this deck. I will make sure that you guys have the link. Um, that way you can self-serve the information. So if you want to be able to, to figure it out all on your own, get some training, um, there's tons of resources. And in particular, uh, Advisora, if you guys have never heard of that, I would highly encourage you to go to it. They have several free courses that you can take that are all, um, I think, implementer, lead implementer, internal auditor, lead internal auditor, or something like that. They're relatively short and they take you through the whole thing. Um, very easy to follow. So if you're looking for more training on, you know, the ISO 27001 in particular, I would highly encourage you to go there. Uh, and like I said, the links at the, the end of this deck. So you'll be able to, to self-serve that information. So what are the must-do items? Um, like I said, we'll talk about a couple of these things uh, in depth a little bit more, in particular, statement of applicability. Mandatory documents, these are the things that the auditor is going to expect that you have in place, whether it's information security policy, risk assessment and treatment methodology, things like that. So we'll dig into that into one of the next slides. We'll also talk about the anatomy of your scope statement. So. Um, your ISMS, you need to be able to have that detailed scope statement in there and be able to have that within a scoping document because that's going to set the stage for everything that you're doing within your program. Uh, statement of applicability. So this is all the things from Annex A that you have implemented within your ISMS scope statement. Um, this also shows what other controls outside of those frameworks that you have implemented. Um, then you have your process matrix. So to support your ISMS, the assumption is that you have all these different processes happening. Maybe you have uh, human resources for some of the, the onboarding and termination processes. Maybe you have information technology for other processes that are happening. So you need to have some awareness there. Now, I don't have an example, but if you guys want to dig into that one a little bit more and how you could possibly frame it out, um, we could probably take a swag at doing it in a spreadsheet while I have things up and ready. So um, if anybody needs that sort of training, just drop it in the chat and I'll uh, try to spend a couple minutes on it. So everything from clauses four through 10, that's a mandatory must do item. You can't get away from it. Um, and I would highly encourage you to be very aware of that standard and comb through it. And in particular, read all the details in clauses four through 10. Uh, implementation of Annex A controls based on your unacceptable risk. So that will be another activity we'll dig into um, here in a little bit is your risk assessment and ultimately getting that into your statement of applicability and then your internal audit. So um, internal audit it is a certain duration for how big your ISMS is. So um, you can work with an internal auditor to get those numbers down, but it should be a acceptable length of time that correlates with how many people are needed to run your ISMS. So um, it only needs to be done once a year, but if you have a larger organization, breaking it up quarterly would probably be a good way to go. Um, does put a little more headache and strain on your security team or whoever's managing your ISMS to make sure that those are all happening, but it kind of reduces the, the chunk of doing it once a year. So up to your organization how you want to break it down, but you definitely need to make sure that you're having it. And, Internal audit is just a good way to go anyways, because um, when you think about your ISMS and how it's working and that continuous improvement cycle, 
one of the, the things that you can leverage is your internal audit. So are you having non-conformities? Are they being identified? Are they making it into the corrective action process as an indicator that you're you're functioning as expected. Now, what you really want is non-conformities being reported by users within the ISMS because then that's demonstrating they have education and they understand how it's supposed to work and all those good things that you want to happen. But you also want to make sure it's being identified in internal audit and then you're taking the appropriate steps. Taking it a step further, if you have your external auditor come in and they come to evaluate your ISMS and they they find you know a finding for whatever it is, you can be like, well, we already uh, knew that we already identified it as an issue. We have a corrective action in place, and now they're be able to see that your processes are working as expected because it's expected that you have internal audit and it's expected that you have findings. Um, I think they would be more suspicious if you didn't have findings because everybody has findings and we don't operate perfectly all the time, right? So internal audit, it's a really cool tool to have or a good tool to have. Um, I wouldn't just do the bare minimum. I would see what all you can get from there. So we'll, we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into mandatory documents here. So you have your scope of your ISMS. So this is going to detail what's in scope, what's out of scope, how we want that uh, scope statement to look. And I think we cover that on the next slide here. Your information security policy, because I'll also have your information security objectives, your risk assessment and treatment methodology, your statement of applicability, your risk treatment plan. So that methodology that we just talked about, well, that has to go somewhere and that's your risk treatment plan. Um, we'll also talk, you need your definition of roles and responsibilities, inventory of assets, um, and some other various documentation. Now, the caveat here is some of those documents, if you uh, can see on the screen, say A.7.1.2, A.13.2.4, that indicates that it comes from Annex A. So while it's considered a mandatory document, it's mandatory if that item was selected from Annex A for implementation. So you gotta be mindful of that. Um, a lot of organizations will likely have business continuity and, and things like that. But if you are an organization that doesn't need uh, secure system engineering principles, then that may not be a document that you end up developing from the Annex A. So a lot of work goes into the figuring out what controls you need from Annex A and things like that to be able to, to get to that point. So, Anatomy of a scope statement. What does this look like? Well, you want to say your ISMS, your information security system, and then you want to get to what all security programs are trying to do, and that's the CIA triad. So confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So you want to have that in the scope statement. Um, you'll also want to state what those business processes are. So um, this scope statement, I pulled it from a capstone that I taught where we just throw in something about uh, mental health and behavioral um, in healthcare or something or other, but it really depends on the organization. Um, maybe you have a SaaS solution, maybe you're providing consulting services, just depends on the org. So definitely mixed there, but you'll want it to be a, a somewhat vague statement that articulates what your organization does. Um, you'll want to say where it's located or where you're maintaining it from. And then you'll also want to say in accordance with the statement of applicability, you could take it a layer deep and say what kind of controls are also built into your statement of applicability. So um, I actually just went through a renewal audit for ISO 27001 last week and um, got some additional training on scope statements and how to kind of make them a little bit better, make them a little more developed for the org. And the auditor ended up building in um, in accordance with the statement of applicability in alignment with high trust version 9.3. So the same client that got high trust um, in building in, well, yes, we have statement of applicability and it includes Annex A, but it also includes mapping of high trust controls because they had also gotten high trust certified. So um, the statement of a, or the scope of scope of your ISMS definitely mixed. It depends on the org, but this is generally what you can expect from your scope statement. So your scope document may also include your interested parties. Uh, if anybody wants to take a deeper dive into interested parties, please let me know. Um, that's another one that we can quickly whip up. So your internal, your external, your legal, regulatory, and contractual requirements are all built into this document. So it's not good enough that you have your ISMS, 
you have to take it a step further and be able to identify what are all the factors influencing your program. Do you have regulatory requirements like HIPAA that you need to have incorporated into your ISMS and maintain awareness of? So good document there. If you feel like you want some quick training on it, just let me know. Okay, statement of applicability. This document, highly important here at ISMS because it is going to indicate all the things that you have in place, whether fully implemented, not implemented, et cetera. So um, I have an example on here. I think I pulled it from advisor or something or other, but I felt like that wasn't going to be enough for us today. So we'll just take a, a quick walk through of what it could look like in a spreadsheet. Now, I'm going to say, if you are an organization that has a GRC tool, I would highly encourage you not to try to manage it in a spreadsheet. It's, it's super tedious. It's miserable. Just back away from the spreadsheet. Um, using a GRC tool is probably your best bet. But if you don't have that, you can absolutely do it in a, a spreadsheet. Um, it's just not ideal if you are building framework on framework on framework. So just keep that in mind. Um, what are some GRC tools out there? All right, so uh, you could use OneTrust. Um, I think Zen GRC is one that you can use. We leverage OneTrust a lot at CISO. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility of being able to um, kind of modify it however you want. So you can do like vendor risk management, customization, and things like that. Um, I don't know if Archer has the, the capability to do the statement of applicability like that, but um, that could definitely be one that you do an analysis on. Um, let's see, fusion risk management. I used that several years ago. We did it for vendor risk management, but the platform was built off of Salesforce, if I remember right, and it had a lot of functionality in there. So they may have gotten it to the place now where, um, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't blame you. It's not my favorite whatsoever. Obviously, you could tell I'm dissing the spreadsheet on this uh, workshop. So um, definitely evaluate the tools, especially if your organization is getting more and more mature. It's just not going to work for you in the long run if you're trying to build on the other framework. So good question there. Um, so you guys will see I have statement of applicability up on the screen. I did not include all of Annex A. I threw this together relatively quickly. So I just pulled out a couple areas so you guys could see. So we have security policies, human resource security, and communication security. Now, keep in mind, Annex A controls are only selected as a result of a risk assessment, or it could be contractual or other things. So not everything in the, the statement of applicability may be fully implemented, um, but you have to give that reason of justification why you may not be doing it. So um, depends on the org, depends on what you guys are trying to do. In the case of the, the system engineering principles, maybe your organization doesn't develop software, and that would be a reason why you would not include that particular control within your um, Annex A. Or there's controls in here like cabling security and stuff like that, that, you know, maybe you inherit that from the, the data center or data security place or the, the data warehouse or what am I trying to say, <laughs> the cloud environment where they have the, the physical security in there. So... Um, lots of reasons why not to include it. So this statement of applicability, it just has, um, you know, selection if it's a legal requirement, if it's a contractual requirement or contractual obligation. So um, let's say that you sign a contract with one of your clients, client has uh, information security agreement, addendum, whatever you want to call it. And they say, we expect you to have network controls in place. Okay, well, maybe you select them that because of, you know, the network controls that you need. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so it, hopefully it's not super tiny on your screens. Okay, so then you also have best practice. So maybe you're selecting the control because it's just industry best practice. Um, and then results of a risk assessment. So you do your asset-based risk assessment or whatever risk methodology that you decide to go with and you select that based on it. So this is where the GRC tool really starts to come in handy. So if you're able to leverage your GRC tool for a risk assessment, well, then you can tie the risk associated with the Annex A control back to here. So now you have some ticking and tying happening. Um, a good example of how this would be useful is whenever we are going through a renewal audit last week, and this is where I'm gonna pull a lot of my examples because it's so fresh in my mind. 
the auditor, almost every time that he started going down a path that he wanted to evaluate, he's like, well, did you identify this on your risk assessment? You know, give me the ID number. And a lot of instances, I was able to provide it to him. But he really wanted to see how we tied our risk assessment activities into the Annex A. And obviously, this was spread over, you know, a three-year time period from the time they got their initial certification till renewal. But he was really wanting to see that sort of life cycle of, you know, how we selected the the risk and how we um, selected the Annex A and, you know, kind of incorporating it. So that would be a really good use for having that DRC tool. Then you talk about the method documentation. So for this one over here where you have policies for information security, well, your information security policy is likely going to be that documentation. Um, whereas maybe 7.1.1 for screening, you have your access control policy in an employee handbook. Again, this is mixed. It depends on the organization and how you set up your, your documentation. If you have an organization that has maybe one giant document, then that one, one document may be all of the documentation here. Um, the same thing down here for network controls. Maybe you have a network security standard that details all of that out for you. So this activity of maintaining this document can become quite, quite large. And again, case in point, if you have a, a GRC tool, then not only are you able to link your risk there, but you can start linking your documentation. So you can say, well, this document ties to this Annex A, which supports, you know, addressing this particular risk and so on. Then you will also want to have documented maybe your process areas in here. So huge lesson learned that I, I went through last week is that all of my process area owners are not going to remember everything I tell them despite giving them training. And so one of the things that we're going to start doing here shortly is identifying mapping of better process areas to the Annex A control. So when they go into the audits, they very clearly know, even though Rose told them what to do, they clearly know what they're going to be talking about. Um, this is just to enable them to be more successful. And we'll talk about this later, um, where the process area owners, you want to make sure that they're getting enough training, enough knowledge so that they go into their audits confident and know what to say and not stumbling over or giving too much information because you don't want that happening either. Because if they give too much information, that opens the door for the auditor and the auditors, you know, you open the door for me, let me come in and check things out. Um, so you don't, you want to make sure they're getting the right coaching and they have the right confidence level. And then you want to say if it's implemented or not. So this is a very, very quick example of a statement of applicability. Um, it can definitely become comp complex and the things that you include in it. Um, you could put all sorts of things in there and make it, you know, really thorough um, just depends on how much you want to frame out there, but it, at a minimum, you should definitely have the Annex A tied to the, the risks that you address, the implementation status, um, and a couple more things in there. But you want to make it useful for the org, too, and not, you know, a document that you only do look at when it's time to go through the audit, because then it's starting to be useless for you and just activity and updating documentation. So let me jump back into this presentation here. Okay, so those were my must do items, but I have a section and I call don't skimp where it counts. So um, yes, it is a living document. So it shouldn't be changing a whole lot, but keep an assumption that it should be a living document. You should be updating it regularly. Um, and I mean, you can do it once annually and it'd still be fine. But then are you putting yourself in a position that you're having to spend hours doing that activity versus just maintaining it a couple minutes a month? So depending on, you know, what, what can you spare capacity wise, if you can't spare, you know, doing it at one point in the year, because, you know, that one point in the year, it's just going to be swamped with, you know, getting ready for the audit. Then I would make sure that you're updating it more regularly. So don't skimp where it counts. Things that I've really learned or that I felt like my clients should have realized. So buy and use the standard. But that's like my top one. So um, went to do a ISO 27001 implementation and a SOC 2 integrated implementation and um, had to really encourage my client to buy the standard. And you know, this is going to be where the auditor is able to really assess, like, did you actually implement in accordance with that standard? So 
that standard gives you all the information you need to, to be able to implement. So they're, they're going to want to know that you went to the source and the source is the ISO 27001 standard and implemented it in accordance with that. So make sure you buy and use a standard, um, kind of set it as your ISMS Bible. Obviously, you can start pulling in other things as needed, but make sure you have that document. And it's not expensive. The, I think the last time I looked at it, it was around the $100 range, $125. So if your organization has already made the commitment to implement an ISMS, I'm sure $125 would be fine for them to spare to, to be able to get that standard. So what's the difference? So the ISO 27001 is really, it's I, a lot of it's broken down into like how you go about the implementation. So you have the NIST cybersecurity framework, which has the um, what is it? The detect, protect, identify, recover and respond, the five areas. Um, so those five areas are broken down with various controls and ultimately to get you to a framework, um, and they're reflective of what's in the NIST 853. So getting like a comprehensive, however, in the ISO 27001 standard, you have the clauses that set you up in that continuous improvement cycle, kind of the same themes, but not as much really enforcing that management buy-in. Um, and then you have the Annex A, which is like, you're implementing those controls as a result of the risk assessment. Now, NIST cybersecurity framework, there's not a certification process or anything like that to get it. Obviously, you can have an independent organization and come in and, and tell that you've gotten it. Um, in fact, whenever my client got HITRUST certified, one of the deliverables that the HITRUST organization gave them was the mapping of HITRUST to cybersecurity framework, the NIST cybersecurity framework, and how they did and whether or not they're compliant with all the controls. Um, now, for the ISO side, you have to have an auditor come in, you have to have that auditor, for, auditor certify, and then you have a maintenance cycle that needs to happen. But what's the, the primary difference between NIST and ISO is ISO is an internationally recognized standard framework that organizations can implement. So if you're a company that's looking to have international business, um, looking to spread your wings and do other things, that framework is recognized throughout the world. Now, NIST, that's primarily in the United States. So um, while there is a mapping out there and things like that, um, ISO holds a, a, a little more weight when you start to expand outside of the, those parameters, especially because you're having that auditor come validate that your program is actually operating. Um, so yes, when I say the standard, I do mean the ISO 27001 standard. Uh, so the company chooses if they want to be ISO. It's not, nope, it's not a mandatory one unless, here, here's where we get into a little bit of tricky. If you have a client that wants you to get ISO 27001, maybe the company would then consider it mandatory. But it's not, as far as I'm aware, and if you're in here and you've heard otherwise, it's not a mandatory thing that companies do. Um, now, if you do implement, there are mandatory things that you have to do with the ISO 27001 to be able to get to, through the certification process. Not sure if I answered your question exactly, but we can dig in that one a little bit more if you need to. Oh, I wasn't ready to move off of this one yet. So uh, communication, that's key. Um, I do have its own little slide. I think we'll just blaze through that one. The key here is know your implementers know your management, and just generally know your audience. So make sure that you have all of the right people um, involved and that you're talking to each group right. So management, what's the bottom line? What are the high level summaries and how to get them bought in? Whereas the implementers, hey, implementer, I need you to do a network security control. I need you to implement access control. I need you to do whatever. And then you have the workforce. Hey, workforce, I need you to have awareness of the ISMS and what it is and how it operates. So um, definitely know how you're communicating. The process is as long as the organization can support. So a non-answer, but I'll explain. Your organization, it depends on how large you are, what you can afford to do, your capacity, your budget, all these things that play into it. Um, last year, I did the ISO and SOC 2 implementation in six months, which is really, really aggressive. I would highly recommend organizations not doing that. This organization had about 20 people, and so it was really doable. But if you're a larger organization, you have lots of moving pieces and parts, I would definitely not do um, a six-month implementation. I would probably do about a year, and that's 
allowing some grace room, allowing for interruptions, allowing for capacity issues, tooling resources, all those different things that are really going to play an impact into your timeline. So um, make sure you have your leadership buy-in. We have already talked about that one because of the time. I'll just blaze over past that. Um, corrective action process, we're going to talk about that one in its own area because I feel like you doing a deeper dive in there would be the most benefit. Um, don't use the ISO logo anywhere. I kid you not, guys. Two years in a row, same clients, same auditor. Client got in a lot of trouble for using the ISO, the wrong ISO logo. So you're not supposed to just use the, the ISO logo that you can find on Google. Um, if you are ISO 27001 certified, you should be using the authorized logo that comes from your auditor that has assessed your ISMS. So there's very particular logos. And if you are looking to get ISO 27001 certified, likely your external auditor will have that information for you in the contract. And when they come to do the audit, that's one of the things they look everywhere for is making sure that you have used that ISO logo appropriately for the environment and that you've stated correctly on any public facing websites that how you have your ISM is implemented. So they're very particular on how you use the logo and how you say you have your certification. So if you're looking to pursue that, just be very cautious in the things that you're doing and how you're approaching them. Know your interested parties. So um, if you are a organization that is in a highly regula regulatory type environment, so let's use PHI, for example, say you're a healthcare organization, well, an interested party for your organization would fall under that, that legal, regulatory, contractual type area is HIPAA. You need to make sure that you maintain awareness of the HIPAA security rule, HIPAA privacy rule, and how that integrates into your ISMS and the things that you're doing. Um, let's say that you are a organization that maybe is working international and in particular in the EU. Well, maybe your interested parties is maintaining awareness of GDPR. So um, again, it's mixed, but make sure that you have awareness of how those regulatory things are impacting what you're doing. Maintaining your program after implementation. I can't tell you guys how important that is. Um, this is not a implement it and then just let it sit and run. You have to maintain it or you lose the certification. And you have to be able to demonstrate it year over year. And then if you do make it to a renewal, you have to be able to demonstrate it for three years that it was running and that you maintained it. So uh, you can maintain your program uh, by either spreadsheet, by GRC tool or whatever. Um, and you can make uh, essentially a matrix of all the things that need to happen on cadences. So let's say awareness training needs to happen annually and internal audits need to happen quarterly. We need to do a tabletop exercise annually. And you kind of have that list of all of your cadence driven activities and then the other processes should be happening as expected because they may be ad hoc in nature. Um, another item is understanding your information, information security management system is not just GRC. So a lot of times we think that, you know, GRC, we're running the thing, we're the only ones involved in it, and it's absolutely not the case. A well-established ISMS calls on every single part of the organization calls on technology, software engineering, human resources, your um, help desk, your IT support, whatever, everybody's involved in it. And once you have that understanding across the board and you work with those implementers, those whoever's within the ISMS, um, you really start to understand it's not just the governance risk and compliance, it spans over technology, spans physical security or whatever. And you wanna make sure that you're really communicating that. Now, the last item on there is building an achievable timeline. That goes back to my example I was just saying. Don't try to do it in six months if you're you know, ver very large. You want to make sure that you have a timeline that's achievable for the organization. And the key thing here is this implementation is not for the faint of heart. Everybody has to be bought into it. And if you aren't working with the other groups that need to be bought into it, you may run into issues. So a good example is, let's say you have 10 technical controls that you need to implement and the implement implementation of those 10 technical controls may be, let's say 40 hours of worth of work and that's just a random number. Um, well, who's to say technology actually has those 40 hours to, to spare? 
maybe they have their own capacity issues. They have sprint planning and things like that happening. And you've built this timeline that says, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get ISO certified within, you know, seven months or whatever. Well, you're not working with those counterparts to make sure it's achievable timeline. So you have to balance that against the business objectives and the things that they're wanting to do to be able to, to hit on those things. So definitely you want to make sure it's achievable working with your counterparts and that just works to, to establish a really good re relationship, right? So if you're, hey, partner, hey, tech, hey, whoever, you know, I've been directed to do this program and I think we're going to need you with these, you know, these items. What are we looking at? How can I en uh, enable you to help me to do these things and start creating those really great partnerships? Because that's going to allow you to be successful. But if you don't do that, if you don't work with the partners, you don't work with whoever, you're going to hit a lot of resistance and it's going to cause delays and it's just going to be a lot of headache, um, especially you know, maybe you have groups that just don't understand what we're doing and you're having to take more time to explain all of this. So when you build your timeline, you want to take the time into consideration for, you know, the actual implementation, but you also want to take the time in for, you know, resourcing, um, building in some buffer, building in buffer for possibly tooling issues and building in buffer for education, because the education is going to be key here to make sure that you're successful. So lots of things go into that timeline. So we'll just skip, just know your audience for the communication. Um, this graphic, I love it a lot. It comes from Advisor. Um, you guys, Advisor is great. If you haven't already gotten on there, highly recommend get on Advisor, check it out. Um, this graph came from there. The resource link is at the end of this deck. I'll share out the link. Um, it takes you through the steps of what you can expect. So if you are in the initial stages of trying to plan your implementation, trying to figure out what your ISMS is going to look like, I would highly encourage you to go to this. It'll help you build that achievable timeline. So getting your management support, um, defining your scope, writing your policies, writing your methodologies, doing the, the actual activities and things like that. So um, make sure that you check this out, use it to build your, your time frame. Um, lots of good resources in there. Corrective action plans. So this is um, one a, of the most important parts of your ISMS. So um, you have nonconformities that are going to happen in your program. They're bound to happen. If you have an organization that says we don't have any nonconformities, they're lying. Everybody always has nonconformities. Um, so the corrective action process or the corrective action plans are really meant to allow your organization to address those nonconformities when they actually come up. So all of this information can be pulled to um, 10.1. Uh, good question. You can pull the exact language from the uh, standard. So if you go to the standard and you know what, I might have a PowerPoint I could pull up and show you guys real quick because I just did training at my own organization on nonconformities and corrective action plans. So um, in a second, I'll stop sharing so that I can go find that and that way you can actually see it. So um, it's from 10.1 and you can use any sort of repository. You could be a GRC tool, it could be a spreadsheet, Word document, whatever to, for these corrective action plans. Um, just make sure that you identify how you want that to happen and stick to it. I will tell you that if you're an organization that's slowly starting to mature, starting the spreadsheet is great. Um, the limitations there is you're not enabling the people that are assigned the nonconformities to be able to self-serve the information. So you're in a perpetual state of blocking them from resolving their nonconformities because they don't have all the information that they need. Um, we recently implemented the corrective action process into JIRA. So if you guys have JIRA and you have admin rights or you can work with someone to get you admin rights, you can put your corrective action plans into JIRA and start to use it as a repository. And so maybe you don't necessarily need to get a GRC tool. So you can definitely use those resources that are available to you. Okay, let me stop sharing real quick. Let's see. find that for you before we get into the other areas. And hopefully I don't take up too much time doing a very quick search on this. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. What I have up here is just some training that I did internally. Um, we do this thing called lunch and learns every Monday. They're great. 
Um, everybody can kind of pick a topic that they want to pick. And obviously I pick GRC topics, but we do these lunch and learns. And so for this week, I went over nonconformities um, and in particular, tell the difference between minor and major. But to answer your question, corrective action plans coming from 10.1 this is all of the, the expectations within that standard. So are you reacting to the nonconformity? You're taking action to control it, whatever that action is. And I have an example on this spreadsheet that I'm going to pull up here in a second. Um, you're eliminating the causes of that nonconformity. So a big kicker here is the root cause analysis. So you want to prevent future instances of that nonconformity from happening. So the expectation is you're doing a very good root cause analysis to make sure that it's not happening in the future, because then what will happen if you don't, you'll have future instances of it. And that could indicate that your ISMS is not working appropriately. Um, you need to implement any corrective action needed. you got to review the effectiveness. you got to make changes to the ISMS or identify if you need to make changes to your ISMS um, and then make sure you have it documented. So at a glance, that's what you can expect from the standard, what it looks like and how um, how detailed it expects you to be. So these are probably going to be the most detailed activities that you do for your entire information security management system. Obviously, there's a lot of particular requirements in there, right? So um, they, they kind of expect that of you to have them in here, right? So I do have an example. Again, this is another example that I whipped up really, really quickly. In fact, I did this the other day for the training that I did for my team. So this is an example of leveraging a spreadsheet in order to be able to do your corrective action plans. I will tell you now, if your organization is relatively new to your ISMS, having the spreadsheet is perfectly fine. Once you start to grow and mature, it becomes a headache. Um, Spreadsheets are great for what they are, but once you ha start having a lot of these, and as you guys can tell, there's a lot of particular requirements that you need to have. Spreadsheets just not the way to go. So um, you can leverage a GRC tool, you can have Jira, you can have whatever. You ultimately just want to make sure that the people that are assigned the corrective action plans will have the information they need to be able to go resolve the nonconformity and take the appropriate actions. So. Um, in here, you will want to have some sort of ID associated with it. So, you know, it has a unique identifier when it was reported, um, who it was reported by. So it could be, you know, an internal audit finding. It could be an observation by security. It could be reported by someone at the organization. Um, I have one client, their program is insanely mature. They have people you know, finding nonconformities, reporting them directly to security and helping take action for them. And that's what you want to see. So this will allow you to, to get really mature there. Um, the environment, a short title, um, and then an actual description of this. So for this instance, I just use Slack. Um, users have been using Slack, an unencrypted method to exchange passwords to accounts. Um, this is out of compliance with the password policy and standard and Annex A 9.3.1. This is the key here. So this is what's telling you what's caused the nonconformity because the nonconformity is not conforming to the, the governance that you have in place. And in fact, let me come back in here. So non-fulfillment of a requirement. So um, it could be, but limited to, or not limited to the standard. So the ISO 27001 standard, company owned governance, such as a policy or standard or third party contractual obligations. Um, could be the regulatory obligations too. Maybe you're not fulfilling a HIPAA requirement, whatever it is. So a lot of those drivers, but the key is you want to have that in there. Um, you'll want to have who it's assigned to. So I use Michael Scott because Michael Scott from the office is always into shenanigans. So in here, you'll want to make sure that you appropriately segment these different areas out. So you can see here, I use 10.1.8.1 to kind of drive what I'm writing in here. And I have this templated from really long ago because we were wanting to make sure that we got that information in there. So taking the action to control and correct it and then dealing with the consequences. So in here, we said they were transmitting the passwords. Well, the immediate action could be not the only thing immediate reset of those credentials that are transmitted in Slack. So that's your immediate action. And then understanding the impact and the consequence. So in this instance, um, maybe there's confusion of process, business processes among the workforce or unauthorized disclosure of uh, company information. So obviously they are 
transmitting the passwords, someone may have that password who's not authorized to do so, and now you might have unauthorized disclosure of information. So you'll also want to have mitigating action in here. Um, implement any needed action, you review the effectiveness of it, and then you identify if there's any changes to the ISMS. So um, for this instance, we just said, okay, well, we're going to identify the teams leveraging Slack. We are going to make sure they get all of that information into Keeper if it's not already in there. And then we're going to train the staff on these processes. Your corrective action plan may have more detail than that. It may have less detail, but it needs to have some sort of plan in place to prevent future instances of it reoccurring and align with um, the root cause analysis. So for this, there's no changes to the ISMS. Maybe the organization, they are very clear. They do not want tra pa passwords transmitted in the clear. There may be other instances where you decide there are changes to the ISMS. Um, and one example that I can recall is I had um, a company implement teleworking in in particular teleworking for high trust, which has very particular requirements. Um, and they put a, a, a statement into one of the documents that was too prescriptive um, against the actual requirements. And so they got audited and they realized, oh man, like this is a lot of work we weren't prepared for. They went back to the controls and it was, we identified it was too prescriptive. And so we decided to take it out. Well, in that instance, it might be a change to the ISMS because we're modifying the governance and things like that to address the, the situation. Um, oh, another good question in there. High trust is a cybersecurity framework that came out, um, oh man, I can't recall, probably about five years ago, where it's more geared toward healthcare organizations. So um, this certification process allows you to identify how much PHI you have in your control, how many users you have, and other identifying information like that. And then they pick a selection of controls based on those requirements. And then you go about implementing them um, really geared towards the, the PHI, the healthcare. Oh, Lauren, great question. Um, I'm going to try to do a abbreviated version of that. NIST standards are uh, largely based in the U.S., why the ISO 27001 is more international. Um, NIST, you know what? That's really vague. So we have NIST 853. We have the 171. Um, so the 53 is the security and privacy controls. That's leveraged for FedRAMP and other frameworks. Um, those are really, really prescriptive when you look at them, and they can be broken out into the different baselines of low, moderate, and high. So um, ISO 27001, it's just clauses 4 through 10, and then Annex A, which has 114 controls. But ISO is recognized internationally, and there's a certification process for that, and there is not one for NIST unless you get an external auditor to come in and look at it. So root cause analysis, you could just use the five why here. Um, five why, well, why did this happen? Why did this happen? And you go down the path. And in this instance, I just said do of um, lack of awareness for the ISMS and subsequent governance documents. So um, and then also you identify if there's any other nonconformities here. So again, if you are resolving the root cause of why something happened, then you shouldn't see any other instances of it. But if you do see other instances, well, now you can start tying them together and maintain some awareness. So um, want to have that in there. So that's how you can use your spreadsheet for it and how you can take all of these things that we pulled out in these corrective action plans and apply it in there. All right. I think I'm running out of time. Apparently, I love to talk to you guys. So I'm going to try to blaze through um, a couple more areas real, real quick. So let's see. Put a bow on it. Real quick, tick and tie your program. And what I mean here is make sure from start to finish, whatever it is, that you clearly have your evidence. So if you're the person, governance, risk, and compliance, and you're kind of maintaining all of it, know your information. If you have a risk in your risk register, have all the artifacts. If you have governance documents that you do have when they were developed to when they got approved and when they were put in the pol your policy SharePoint. Um, you know, Lauren, I think they said they're going to record it and make it available to all of the attendees um, within the next couple of days. And then I think in a couple of weeks, they'll be live for everybody. So you should be able to catch the beginning. Um, and if not, I think I have this presentation recorded somewhere else. So um, maybe just not as detailed as I did today. All right. So you'll also want to do a manual. So your manual, it'll just look like 
let's see here if I could actually get it to go to the next page. No, it doesn't want to go. Let's see. We'll just click. All right. So your manual, it'll just have like all these different things that you have in your program, your scope, your organizational structure, your asset inventory, and all these different things. This is mainly just to make it easier during your audit. So the auditor says, well, where's your asset inventory? Where's your statement of applicability? Where's whatever? This allows you to have it in here. Now, if you have a GRC tool or other tooling, you might not necessarily need to do this. But if you're doing everything manually, I would recommend that you have some sort of repository together. And then the last thing I'll touch on is audit prep. So audit prep is very critical for your organization. You need to make sure the people talking know what they're talking to, how they're talking to the auditor. You want to make sure you have an auditor selected, know the technology, have a checklist. So uh, make sure that you know, like, here's all the things that I need to do. And a lot of times your external auditor is going to send you the audit plan, who they want to talk to and things like that. Um, have a prep session with the main stakeholders. So one of the things I love to do every single year, and it has not steered me wrong yet, is I plan an entire day. It's about eight or nine hours. I get everybody in the same room, our CISO, um, the people that are the main stakeholders, not, you know, you know, Sal or Sue from People and Culture or Human Resources. I get the main stakeholders. And we go through every single piece of evidence that we have to poke holes. What if the auditor says this? What if he says this? And make sure we have the, the picture all together. It's a really beneficial activity. It gets everybody on the same page and everybody's so much more confident going into the audit. Prep the auditees. So um, the people that aren't included in that session, go sit down with them. Talk to them about what they're going to do. Give them that confidence level and just make sure that they're ready for the audit. And enable them to be successful, right? We want to make sure that everybody's going in happy and confident into their audit and that they're not like, oh man, I'm so scared to do this because maybe we could have prevented that. And, you know, we don't want them to get a bad taste in their mouth. So we'll make sure that they're ready. And I think that is the last thing that I need to get through in here. Um, if you guys like wanted to cover anything else, I am fairly active on all these channels. So feel free to to drop me a message, say, hey, can we talk about this? So don't mind at all. Um, if any of you guys follow me on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter, you guys know I do a lot in the public speaking space. So I definitely don't mind um, helping you guys out if you have any other questions. And then this also has references. So um, I'll share this out in the Slack area. So that way, if um, people didn't attend, they'll have access to this. So um, thank you for coming today. And if you have any questions, just reach out.